Hello, welcome to one of the final sessions of reInvent this year. I'm Greg Roth, I'm with the Identity and Access team. I'm one of the engineers that designed large parts of the AWS Key Management Service, and I'd like to talk to you about using it in some of your applications today. I'll be answering questions down at the end. I also see Todd Signetti from CloudHSM is over there, and Ken Beer should be somewhere, so there should be several of us to take your questions. We're going to start with a brief background and overview of encryption. I promise I will only spend five minutes on it, and if you want a more in-depth treatment, there are references at the end. We'll go over what the AWS Key Management Service is, how it works, what it can do for you, walk through an integration of an example application, and then go into some depth on encryption context and the policies that you can write about it, look at some code samples using the Java SDK, and then we'll look at grants. I assume that you have some amount of experience using the AWS SDK in some language, that you have some data that you'd like to protect. Well, a background in applied cryptography is helpful, it is not expected. And the final thing that I expect is that you have current client libraries. In order to better protect your data, the key management service requires that you connect using TLS sessions for forward secrecy. And we have seen reports that very old client libraries, especially things like Java 5, Java 6, have problems connecting and negotiating reasonable cipher suites. You'll, you will have the least problems getting started if you are using up-to-date software. So, Let's start with a brief overview of symmetric encryption. The goal here is not to turn you into a cryptographer, but to provide some background information. Symmetric encryption is where you are using the same key to encrypt and to decrypt. It is typically employed to achieve two security properties. Confidentiality, which is data cannot be read by parties other than those that you expect. And integrity, which is that the data is protected from modification. There is some suggested reading in the appendix. At a very high level, encryption is the process of combining a key with some plain text data to produce a ciphertext. For the types of encryption that we're talking about today, the key will typically be a 128 to 256 bit random bit string. The ciphertext should have the property that it is useless without the key, or more formally, it doesn't reveal any information about the plain text to someone who does not have access to the key, often with a caveat about length. Typically, you will learn something about the length of the plain text. Decryption is the reverse of the encryption op operation. So given a ciphertext and a key, you can produce a plain text. It's important to recognize that classic symmetric encryption provides only confidentiality and no integrity. So modes like CBC or CTR of something like AES, you are only getting confidentiality. It's actually hard to use confidentiality only encryption in real systems. And for those of you trying to take pictures of the slides, these will all be posted later. So it's hard to use confidentiality only encryption in real systems. Most developers expect that when they successfully decrypt an encrypted message, the plain text that they get back is unmodified and cannot have been tampered with. To actually get that property, you need something called authenticated encryption. Examples include things like AES GCM. Modern authenticated encryption schemes often will take something called additional authenticated data. This is some more data that isn't being encrypted, but is included in the cryptographic tag that is part of the authenticated encryption. You can think of it as data that will be signed, but not necessarily included in the ciphertext. And so for authenticated encryption with additional authenticated data, the ciphertext is the result of encrypting using a key and specifying in AAD some plain text. And then decryption is the reverse. And decryption will only succeed if both the ciphertext and the AAD were not modified. One example that's used where this is commonly used is 
packet headers, where, for example, the packet headers may need to be in a particular location in the packet for network gear to process it, but you still may want to integrity protect them, so you may encrypt the payload and use the packet headers as additional authenticated data. Sending large objects over a network is expensive. It adds latency, and often you will want to instead use something called envelope encryption, where you will send off a key to be encrypted and then locally encrypt bulk data with the key. Um, if you did not catch SEC 301, which was an overview of an encryption, that talk had a much longer treatment of envelope encryption, and I would suggest looking at it. The overall idea is you use a master key, K1, to encrypt a data key, K2. You then send or store the data key encrypted with the master key and the in-text encrypted with the data key. Someone who has that pair of values can access the message by first decrypting the data key and then using the data key to decrypt the message. So why are you encrypting at all? Well, the purpose of encryption is typically to render data inaccessible without a key. Yes, you are trying to reduce the durability and the availability of your data in order to ensure that only people with a key can read it. Authenticated encryption will also protect the data from modification, and you might do this because it's easier to tightly control access to a key than the data, or because you're trying to achieve independent controls for your key and your data. You might also be encrypting because your compliance people told you you had to. If that is the only reason you're encrypting, you might want to look into using server-side encryption, where we've done most of this work for you. So until now, a typical application running either on AWS or in your data center would either store encryption keys in a config file, in some locally maintained key management infrastructure, or in a hardware security module. The easiest way to get started is, of course, to put your keys in a config file, and that's very commonly done. And the, about the only good thing about it is it's easy and it's cheap. Keys that live in a config file are reasonably exposed. They are exposed to vulnerabilities in your application. So something as common as a path traversal vulnerability in the application that allows files to be read off disk will allow the keys to be read if you use this approach. Anything wrong with your operating system or any other piece of software can often allow keys to be read off the host if you use this approach. And if you have changes in the set of parties that are authorized to log into a host, you don't get very good audit logs. And so your audit logs will probably tell you that someone read the key. And you don't know what they did with it. You don't know whether they made a copy of it. And so when you have that scenario, you often will want to rotate the keys, which will result in you often needing to re-encrypt bulk data, which is very expensive. Hardware security modules are great for security. They are hardened devices that are purpose-built to hold keys and perform operations under them and not let you extract the keys. There are, where you need them, they are a great solution. They take a lot of work to integrate with. They're hard to get started with. We also have Cloud HSM that makes it very easy for you to provision a hardware security module which is a great way to get a FIPS 140 device for your use. The thing to be aware of there is that redundancy is your responsibility, and capacity is provisioned in units of whole HSMs. So you buy one or two HSMs, they run around 1300 a month unless the price has changed, and you start with two for redundancy. As you add capacity, you add it in units of whole HSMs, and again, redundancy availability is all your responsibility. If you're looking for something that's easier to get started with, the AWS Key Management Service is integrated into the AWS SDK and is a lower friction path to getting up and running on something significantly better than a config file.
So let's jump into an overview of the service. The key management service will create a new resource type called the customer master key or CMK. This is a regional resource. It will perform cryptographic operations for you using customer master keys. For every operation that it does, it will enforce policy on that operation. So if you're familiar with S3 bucket policies, customer master keys within the key management service have an analogous policy called a key policy that applies to all operations. It also will provide you with audit records through CloudTrail of every operation that ever happened under your customer master key. It automates durability, scalability, and rotation, and you get HSM-grade security for your applications in about an hour, starting at about a dollar a month, plus, I think, three cents per 10,000 operations. But it's important to realize that there are things it won't do for you. So you can't sprinkle crypto fairy dust on your applications and magically render them secure. Another thing to bear in mind is that keys in the key management service are regional resources. They do not leave the region in which they were created. This means that if you're backing up encrypted data, you will want to re-encrypt typically the envelope key to the target region to ensure that your data that you intend to replicate somewhere else can actually be read somewhere else. And direct encryption using the key management service is limited to 4K of data. This is to optimize for latency. Again, you can use envelope encryption. The normal use case is to encrypt AES keys, although small messages can also make sense in some applications. So the customer master key is the resource type managed by the key management service. It is a non-exportable key. So it is created within the key management service. All the operations under it are performed within the key management service which means that you have audit trails and they're subject to policy controls. The policy controls are either through the AWS policy language or something called grants that we'll discuss at the end. So to actually get started using the key management service, you create a key for use in your application. You can do this through the console, the API, or the CLI. As part of that key creation, you will apply a policy to the key that actually lets your application perform encryption and decryption using the key, and then you'll write some code. So this is what the key management service console looks like. It's actually integrated into the identity and access management console. You can see here that there's an encryption key section down at the bottom. And if you've already been using encryption within EBS, you'll discover that you already have an AWS slash EBS key. EBS encryption has actually been built on top of the key management service since it was released. And what we're giving you now is the ability to create your own keys, use this in your own applications, as well as set policy on your keys and get the audit trails. So you can use custom keys where you set the policy either through AWS services or in your own application. So You'll click Create Key here, and you might note that there's a region selector right at the filter box. You want to select the region where you want the key created. Keys cannot be moved between regions once you create them. You'll be prompted for an alias, which is a human-readable name. There are some more advanced features where you can, point, you can repoint aliases at different keys if you want to atomically switch between backing keys, either for rotation or other use cases like that. There's also a description. The description is just instructions for your developers as to what types of data to protect with this key. You're prompted for key administrators. These are the people who are given policy access to actually edit the policy on the key, and then key usage permissions, which are the users that are allowed to perform operations using the key. So to illustrate the major concepts in the AWS Key Management Service and how they're used in practice, I'm going to walk you through 
the integration of KMS into a, a small sample application that you may already be familiar with. The Amazon Simple Storage Service was one of the first applications that we integrated with the Key Management Service. And so let's walk through what storing an object looks like in S3 without the Key Management Service being involved. So you'll have a client or not, you have a client at the top that sends requests to an S3 web server. These are typically signed requests and include some object that you want to put. The S3 web server will extract some metadata from the request, including the signature, send it off to an authentication component. The authentication component will figure out who the request is from, any policies that should apply, such as IAM user policies, and then we'll return some identity and policy information back to S3. S3 will pull in bucket policies that may apply to your bucket and make an authorization decision about whether the request should or should not be processed. If S3 decides to process the request, S3 will then take the object, cause it to be stored such that it can be retrieved later, and details of that are not particularly relevant to encryption and to actually read data works largely the same way. A signed request comes in, metadata including the signature is extracted, identity and policy is determined, authorization check is performed, and if you have access to the object, then S3 will reconstruct it for you and hand it back. Now let's add in the key management service. So again, let's start with the right path. S3 performs the same authorization that it does when it gets a request. This time, the request can choose to specify the ID for a key in the key management service, or it can specify to use a default key. Again, request goes off, policy and identity for the request is determined. This time, S3 also gets some information that it can use to prove that it has a request from you and that's sent off to the key management service. S3 requests that the key management service generate a unique per object encryption key and encrypts that key using the specified master key. That is returned from the key management service to S3. Again, that is a unique per object key and the per object key encrypted using your master key. S3 encrypts your data using the unique per object key. And then it stores the data encrypted using the unique per object key along with the per object key that is encrypted using your master key. To actually retrieve your data, similar process, request comes into S3 to retrieve the data. S3 pulls out the encrypted object and the per object key that was encrypted using your master key, sends it to the key management service, along with proof that it has a request from you. The key management service independently enforces policy, it looks at the policy that is on the master key and determines whether the requester that made the original request to S3 is or is not authorized to actually have S3 decrypt this data for them. If that checks out, the key management service decrypts the per object key. It also emits some audit records to CloudTrail at this point to give you independent audits of access to the data. And as we'll see later, those audit records even tell you which object is being accessed. S3 uses the local copy of the decrypted key, uses it to decrypt your data, and sends it back to you. One of the key benefits of using the key management service in your application is that you get highly flexible policy controls and highly flexible audit. The audit logs that you get out of the key management service wouldn't be terribly useful to you if all they told you was someone encrypted something or even Bob decrypted something at 10 a.m. 
And so to help you understand exactly what data was accessed, we have a feature called encryption context. Similarly, well, you can get a lot of policy granularity at the key level. For example, Bob may decrypt things that were encrypted using key three. You get even more flexibility if you use encryption context to give us metadata about what is being encrypted and decrypted. So encryption context is our structured interface to additional authenticated data, which is it is a string string map of name value pairs. So it's a set of encryption context name like data classification and encryption context value like critical or encryption context name customer ID and value 12345. And encryption context can be used on several different API calls within the key management service. So when you're performing encryption or key generation, the encryption context can be whatever value is allowed by your policy. So if the policy says that Bob may specify a customer ID in his encryption context and may only encrypt things where the data classification is critical, then that is the policy that is enforced. Decryption, in addition to being subject to policy, has an additional constraint. The encryption context that you specify when you encrypt must be exactly the same as the encryption context that you specify when you decrypt. So when you encrypt, the encryption context is logged to CloudTrail and is available for policy. And when you decrypt, it is, again, available for policy, logged to CloudTrail, and must be the same. This way, you can ensure that when you're encrypting a piece of data that you say is a credit card number the first time around, that when someone decrypts it, they also have to say that it's a credit card number. And you may choose to store the encryption context next to the ciphertext, or it may be information that you already have available from other sources. For example, a row ID in a database or a file name. And so whether you choose to store it or reconstruct it is up to you, but you do need to be able to reconstruct the exact same value. Again, logged in CloudTrail, do not include sensitive data. A good encryption context is this is Bob's credit card. A bad encryption context is this is the credit card and then the full number. <laughs> you, you will want information that will tell you what data is being accessed so that when you're going back and looking at your logs, you can tell whose data was accessed when and where or information that you want to write policy controls about, things like data classifications, project names, to scope down what types of data or which data can be handled in a given application. Some examples, just to put the slide up. So within Amazon S3, the encryption context is AWS S3 ARN, and then the full ARN of your object. This way, when S3 encryption through the key management service is used. You can tell from the key management logs which data was accessed. You can write policy to it if you want, and I'll get into that in a minute. Within EBS, it is the AWS EBS ID and then a volume ID. So vol12345 would be, this is the key that is used to encrypt the volume, vol12345. So this way, you can tell if you use EBS encryption and look at the CloudTrail logs, which volume was mounted to which instance, and you could write policy controls to it if you wanted. Within your applications, data classifications, project names, customer IDs, departments, are all good examples of encryption context. Let's jump into an example of a policy. So this, and again, these slides will be posted. Don't feel like you have to write these down. Encryption context policies use something called conditions within the policy language. And so this policy allows the principal gram to decrypt as long as the encryption context value project, or the encryption context named project has the value green Jupiter. <laughs> 
this one is a similar policy, although it merely says that a data classification must be set. So going back for a moment, for this example, we used in KMS encryption context project, where project was the encryption context name as the left side, and then the value is the right side. Here, we're using encryption context key, which is the name, and then the value here is the name that was specified. So for the encryption context of classification, critical and project Green Jupiter, if I want to require a particular value, I use this, this syntax, KMS encryption context, and then the encryption context key, and then the value. And if I want to instead just require that it be present, I can use this syntax, encryption context key, which is the set of encryption context keys present on the request. And we'll build more on this in a minute, but let's jump into the SDK. So while there are many APIs available in the key management service, you'll find that creation of master keys is something that you might be perfectly happy doing infrequently through the console. And so I'm only gonna talk about the APIs that you would use in your application to directly encrypt and decrypt data. And there are three that I expect you to use heavily. There is encrypt, decrypt, and generate data key. So to actually set up a KMS client, and this is a Java example, you just instantiate a new KMS client. You set the region that you want to talk to. And you might note here that I am not setting up credentials in any way. If you're running on EC2, the SDKs will automatically find credentials for you as long as you use roles for EC2. That helps you avoid, the, part of our goal here is to help you avoid the pain of managing keys and by using rules for EC2, you don't have to manage the credentials that you use to talk to KMS. Those are distributed for you using rules for EC2. We rotate them every few hours. If you're running not in EC2, you can use a properties file or whatever other SDK specific configuration is used to set credentials. Please don't put them in your source code. And if you do put them in your source code, please don't post it publicly. <laughs> and so let's jump into the encrypt call. And again, these slides are available. Please don't copy them. Encrypt takes a key ID, which is a non-secret identifier for the key that is used in the key management service. An encryption context, which is a map of encryption context key to encryption context value and then the plain text that you want to encrypt. And so here I have a key ID of alias my application key. In a real system, I'd probably put this in a config file, but by using an alias here, rather than the absolute key ID, I have the flexibility of repointing it to a different key later. I also won't have to update this if I move it between regions or between accounts. Plain text and an encryption context. Here I'm just using a singleton map to set the department to finance, and that's mostly because anything else wouldn't fit on one line on the slide. You can set a map with multiple values in the encryption context. The limit is documented, I believe it's somewhere around 8K of encryption context. And then build a request, which is just an encryption request where you specify a key ID and an encryption context and plain text, you get back a result. The ciphertext blob on the result is your encrypted data. You can store that encrypted data wherever you want. In order to actually access that encrypted data, you have to make a decrypt call through the key management service. Let's look at a decrypt call. So decrypt, again, similar setup. Note that I have to have exactly the same encryption context. And you also might note that on a decrypt request, I am not specifying the key ID. The ciphertexts that are produced by the key management service encode information that specifically identifies the key and the version of the key so that you don't have to track that piece. We do return a key ID during decryption to help you find 
to help you determine whether this is a key that you wanted to decrypt under, you can also completely control that through policy. So you can give your server access to decrypt under a specific key and no other key, and then decrypt will return unauthorized if you get a ciphertext that was encrypted under someone else's key. And I'll come back to that at the end if we have time. So, Ah, yes, where's my key ID? Again, you do not specify a key ID on decrypt. The third call that I expect to see heavy use of, and actually you'll probably use this more often than you use encrypt, is generate data key. So generate data key is equivalent to either you generating random numbers locally or you asking us to generate random numbers. And yes, there is a generate random API, and yes, you may want to use it, at least to seed your local random number generator, if, unless you have another good source of entropy, and then encrypting that random data key. And so this is primarily to save you some latency in that otherwise you'd have to make two calls. Here you can get one call and it's a little clearer from the audit logs what you did. And so you call generate data key, you pass in a key ID, an encryption context, and you get back a pair of a ciphertext that is an encrypted copy of the data key and the data key. And so here's some sample code. I'll go through it a little more slowly. You set up a key ID, encryption context, make a generate data key request, tell us that you're looking for an AES-256 key, specify the key ID of the master key within the key management service that you want to use, the encryption context, and then what you get back has two properties that you care about. It has a plain text. That plain text is the generated data key that you would use with something like Bouncy Castle to locally encrypt your bulk data. And then a ciphertext blob. The ciphertext blob is just the data key encrypted under your master key. So you will locally encrypt using the plain text value as your key. You will then erase that you'll store the result of your local encryption along with the ciphertext that was produced by generate data key. And you may or may not need to store your encryption context depending on whether it's something you can reconstruct or something that you need to store. And then when you're trying to access that data, you'll take the KMS ciphertext, send it back to KMS decrypt. That'll give you the per object key. You use that to decrypt your local value. It's important to note that the key management service is not a storage service and will not store data keys for you. you. It's perfectly safe to store the encrypted data key right next to the data encrypted with that key because again, it is an encrypted copy of the data key and it can only be accessed by sending it back to KMS decrypt. Please do not store the plain text data key right next to the data that was encrypted with the data key. That's a lot less useful. If you're going to do that, just don't encrypt or use something that doesn't need a key like ROT13 or the null cipher. <laughs> so let's talk about grants for a couple of minutes. So show of hands, who has used S3 bucket policies or is familiar with them at all? OK. So within the AWS policy ecosystem, there are two primary types of policy. There are policies that are set on users or groups, and then there are resource policies. S3 bucket policies are an example of a resource policy. And the way policy evaluation works is when a request comes in, the, all of the policy that's relevant, which is both policy on the user and policy on the resource, is pulled in and is evaluated to determine whether access is allowed. And so within the key management service, we actually support two different types of resource policy. We support key policies, which use the policy language, which is the normal JSON syntax for policies that you're familiar with. We also support grants. It's not quite the same as an S3 object ACL, but it's somewhat similar. So with S3, you have both bucket policies, which are fully flexible, and they, but you get only get 20K of. Within KMS, it's the same story. Key policies are limited to 20K of policy. 
grants are a secondary type of policy. They're less expressive in that you don't have the full condition syntax, you only have a couple of condition types, but what, the, what you get from them is more granular management of the ability to manage permissions. So policy management in AWS has always been somewhat binary. Either a user has permission to replace a particular policy by, given, by being given access to the put policy API, or they don't have that access. And it's very hard to control what policy they can author. Grants give you the flexibility to more finely tune delegation and allow dynamic management of permissions. And so a grant is a five tuple. It is a key, and that's, a grant always applies to exactly one key, a grantee principle. The grantee principle is the principle that the grant applies to. A set of operations. There is a documented list of supported operations that are things like encrypt, decrypt, generate data key, create grant as a supported operation, which means you can use this to chain the ability to grant specific access. A grant constraint, which is optional, and I'll get to that in a minute. And a retiring principle, also optional. This is the principle that's allowed to make the grant go away. So let's recap the difference between a policy and a grant. Policies are fully expressive, limited in size. The policy itself gives you finer granularity control, but policy management is either you can modify the policy or you can't, and if you can modify the policy, you can do whatever you want. And concurrent modification to policies is hard. So if you have many running processes that are trying to dynamically manage access to your data, then it's possible to get into scenarios where you inadvertently overwrite someone else's changes to the policy. Grants are managed individually, so a key can have up to 250 grants on it, and each grant can be independently added, revoked, or modified. You get limited support for conditions, but you can set very fine controls on which grants someone can create, whether they are required to set certain constraints on it or not. Concurrent modification's a lot easier, and the semantics around grants that allow grant creation are fairly natural. If you have a grant that allows you to create grants, you can only create grants that allow access to things that you could do yourself through that grant. So grant constraints. Again, it uses encryption context. There are two supported grant constraints at the moment. One is called encryption context subset, and it takes an encryption context, and it enforces that the grant only applies to requests that contain at least every key value pair in the constraints encryption context. So if I have an encryption context subset constraint of project Green Jupiter classification critical, then that grant applies to a request that says Green Jupiter or project Green Jupiter classification critical customer 12345 because it contains every element that was in the encryption context subset constraint. However, a request that only specifies the project and doesn't specify classification will not be matched by this grant. And then encryption context equals is a more restrictive constraint. It says that it applies only to requests that have this exact encryption context, and it does not apply to requests that include additional information. So as I mentioned earlier, create grant is a valid grant operation. When you have a grant that includes create grant in the set of grant operations, it allows only the creation of grants that are no more permissive than the original grant. And this applies to all dimensions of the grant. So grants have an operation set. If you're creating a grant using the permissions given to you by an existing grant, it automatically enforces that you may only create grants from that grant that have 
a strict subset of the operations that were in the original grant. So if you have a grant that allows create grant, encrypt, and decrypt, it can be used to create a grant that allows create grant and encrypt and removes decrypt. It can be used to set up the original ones, but you can't add new operations using that grant. Similarly, the encryption context constraints are applied. So if Bob has a grant that specifies an encryption context subset constraint of Green Jupiter and Critical, he can create a new grant specifying Green Jupiter. And there's a typo on this slide that should be classification critical and add a customer ID. But he can't create one that removes the classification constraint. And he can't create one that changes the values of project or classification. So actually, the example on this slide would not be allowed because I changed the classification from critical to orange. Grants are actually used within AWS in several places. So for keys where you, for customer managed keys where you create the policy, we never change that policy. However, there are asynchronous workflows where we do need to allow asynchronous decryption. A, a, a good example of this is within EBS. So when you call into EBS, and ask it to mount a volume to one of your instances. EBS will, with proof of the request from the original user, create a grant that says that the instance to which the volume is being attached has permission to decrypt as long as the encryption context is for the volume ID. And so if you actually go call the Create Grant API or use the CLI to list grants on one of the keys that is used by EBS, you'll see grants that correspond to running instances and their ability to decrypt. And if you look at the CloudTrail logs for EBS encryption, you'll see the decryption actually happens from the host running your instance rather than from the control plane. When you detach a volume, the grant is retired, so that host no longer has permission to decrypt data corresponding to the volume. And another thing that you may have noticed is it's possible to use keys managed within the key management service in cross-account scenarios. So just as S3 buckets can be explicitly shared with other accounts, you may share KMS keys with other accounts by putting a policy on them that grants access to particular operations for some other account. This can be useful in sort of partner scenarios where you want to use a key that someone else has control of the policy for and someone else gets the audit logs for, and that that enables them to have great visibility into what you're doing with their data and the ability to turn off your access if they so choose. I've got some resources over here. So I spent about five minutes at the beginning talking about a crypto primer. There is a much better crypto primer um, it's the Stanford Crypto course. It is one of the better introductions out there. Highly recommend it. And also the Bouncy Castle docs are, if you're writing Java code, probably where you'll have to start for any local encryption that you want to do. And I think we're just about out of time, so I will take questions at the end. Ken, are you here? Yes, I am. So Ken Beer is one of the product managers for the service. He's in the back of the room. Todd Signetti is also there. He's with Cloud HSM. And we're all here to answer your questions. And I don't have anywhere I have to go after this.